historic week in Indiana. The state's governor dropping out of his re-election campaign to become the running mate for one of the most unconventional presidential candidates ever. We watched it unfold over the last two weeks, ending with this moment on Saturday. Mike Pence walking into a Manhattan hotel after accepting the role of Donald Trump's vice presidential candidate. Our own Rafael Sanchez there as it happened. It is here in New York City where it all became official. Governor Mike Pence accepting the vice presidential nomination job offer from Donald Trump publicly for the first time. The governor is saying that he received the job offer last Wednesday. For his part, Donald Trump said he picked Mike Pence because of his good character, his jobs record in Indiana, and because Pence could help unify the party. Indiana Governor Mike Pence was my first choice. What a difference between crooked Hillary Clinton and Mike Pence. Mike Pence will never be afraid to speak the name of our enemy. Radical Islam, radical Islamic terrorism. Elections are about choices, and I also joined this ticket because the choice could not be more clear, the stakes could not be higher. Americans can choose a leader who will fight to make America safe and prosperous again and bring real change, or we can elect someone who literally personifies the failed establishment in Washington, D.C. As a party and a people and a movement to make America great again, and that day begins when Donald Trump becomes the 45th president of the United States of America. Now the Trump-Pence ticket is heading to Cleveland for the Republican National Convention. We're packing up. We're also heading to Cleveland. We're heading west to bring you the best coverage over the next couple of days. We'll bring you every possible angle impacting the Indiana delegation, as well as all the events there in the city of Cleveland. Katie, now back to you. Thank you, Raphael. Joined now by our RTV6 political insiders, Pete Seat, Adam Kirsch. Good afternoon, gentlemen. Hello. Good morning, rather. <laughs> Wanted to talk to you about the speech we just heard excerpts from. It didn't take long for Hillary Clinton and the campaign to get right to the heart of attacking uh, the Trump-Pence ticket. What are the pros, what are the cons, and possible risks of Trump, Trump picking Pence? Well, I'll go first, if you don't <laughs> mind, Adam. Uh, I think the pros are that Donald Trump pick the most well-rounded candidate on the short list of people he was looking for. He now has someone with congressional experience, someone with executive experience, someone with a record of results, and as you saw in that speech that, that Governor Pence gave at the announcement, he can stick to the message and deliver it with gusto, and that's a huge asset to Donald Trump. I think what Donald Trump got was a double down on divisiveness. Mike Pence's record has been one of extreme social conservatism. What Donald Trump does get is he walks in that far right wing of the Republican party, which is, quite frankly, it's bizarre that he doesn't have it with less than 120 days to go before the election. Um, quite frankly, the Trump-Pence ticket makes a little bit of sense in the political, but it doesn't have any crossover appeal. They will very much struggle with independence. You know, this was also Pence's uh, opportunity kind of first to introduce himself to the country, and he characterized himself as a small-town boy, a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican. What do you think are the possible risks, possible pros of Pence for Pence joining this ticket, too? Well, I think Mike Pence has always wanted to be in, in Washington, in leadership. Um, his entire career has been about that. He sort of was governor for four years because he thought that was the stepping stone back to Washington, back to the White House. Um, and we saw that in his governing style. So what he does is he gets, a, he gets to be Mike Pence on a broader stage. Now, the risk for him is when this ticket goes down, perhaps on a historic defeat, uh, he may be tarnished with the loss. Mike Pence has always called himself a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. So what you have is consistency, which has not been the hallmark of the Trump campaign up to this point. Mike Pence is consistent in his message. He was consistent in that announcement, and I think he'll be consistent on the campaign trail. Well, one of the criticisms right now is that Mike Pence has changed his decisions, his ideas on policies. How do you respond to that? Well, I, I think it's a good thing that you have you have two candidates, the, vice, the presidential nominee and the vice presidential nominee, who don't see eye to eye on everything. That is a good moment. You know, everyone's like, oh my gosh, the, the two of them don't see eye to eye on everything. That's growth when it comes to Donald Trump. That's maturity as a candidate, that he's willing to bring in voices who don't always agree with him and just say, sir, yes, sir, Mr. Well, Trump. That's huge. But come on, Pete. I mean, in December, Mike Pence called a Muslim 
Muslim ban unconstitutional and offensive, which it is. Mm -hmm. And today we now see Mike Pence flip-flopping and saying, oh, you know what, I'm fine banning Muslims from this country. And that's completely he, inaccurate. He is, he is, is rolling he over on everything. No. He's going to cave. He's going to fall in line because Mike Pence found the brass ring and he gets to, yeah, he gets to be on the national ticket. I actually ticket. watched the interview. I don't know if you did, Adam, but, but what he said was that it makes sense to look at countries that harbor and produce terrorists to look at not allowing people from those countries to come in. It is not a blanket Muslim ban, so stop calling it one. Do we see a change in tone, a change in rhetoric with Mike Pence now on the ticket? Well, of course we do. Mike, Mike Pence has spent a career after running the net most negative campaign in history, defined, declining to be negative. He wrote Confessions of a Negative Campaigner. He since renounced that when he was in a tough race, and now he's going to be Donald Trump's attack dog, and it's going to be a strange tone for him. It's not going to work, I don't think. I think we, uh, we disagree on the definition of negative. I don't think contrast campaigning is negative. He's going to talk about the contrast between Hillary Clinton's failed record as Secretary of State and as Senator and Mike Pence's record of results as governor of our state. Who's next? Who takes over as a Republican candidate for governor? Well, I'm, uh, I'm supporting Eric Holcomb. Uh, our lieutenant governor, I think he's he's uh, got a great record himself. He was at Mitch Daniels' side for eight years, obviously serving as lieutenant governor. It's a seamless transition to go from that job to the office of governor. We'll see what state committee decides. Whenever the Republicans nominate, have to answer how they will govern differently from Mike Pence. So far, all three of them appeared to say that they would basically be a continuation of Pence. Um, and that's what voters want to see. Voters want a clean break from Mike Pence, and I don't think any Republican can do that. Who does John Gregg want to see in that role? Uh, I, don't, I think John Gregg will take anybody he mentioned. So what Adam just said is, is Democrats don't want low unemployment. They don't want the fact that we have the most people employed in the state in the history of Indiana. They don't want increased in, uh, investment in education and transportation and other issues. That's what they don't want. They want to go back to when we had budget deficits rather than surpluses. Well, one, Indiana has a constitutionally required balanced budget, and you know that, Pete. Two, Hoosiers are making less relative to Americans than they have at any point in history. Americans or Indiana's wages aren't keeping up, and that's the problem. That's what people are concerned about. It's not about, are there more jobs? Yes, there are more jobs because you have to work two or three of them to get whole where you used to be 10 or 15 years ago. True or false, is this the worst thing that could happen to the Greg campaign? False. The worst thing that could happen was the other story, Evan By coming back and sucking all the oxygen out of John Gregg's race. This is a great week to be an Indiana Democrat. Evan By is back on the ticket, who has never lost an election in Indiana. There is no Republican candidate for governor. John Gregg's got high name ID, $6 million in the bank, and we're in good shape. And nobody's paying attention to it, but the superintendent of public instruction has almost 10 times her Republican opponent's cash on hand. Do we see Gregg and By campaign together? I'm sure you will. I think we've proved once again that the Indiana Democratic Party is all about Evan Bay. That's all they have. <laughs> Except we have John Gregg, we have Glenda Ritz, we have Andre Carson, we have Pete Wisklowski. We've got a deep bench in this in Democrats. This is a conversation that will no doubt continue. Gentlemen, thank you for your time. Thanks. We appreciate it. Turn now to that other extraordinary development this week. Former Governor and Senator Evan Bayh returning to the political stage here in Indiana. Democrat Baron Hill dropping out of the U.S. Senate race on Monday, clearing the way for Bayh to run for this seat. Remember, he still has $10 million in his campaign fund from when he left the Senate in 2010. Our Rafael Sanchez is with Evan Bayh. Welcome to the program. Thank you, Rafael. Good to be here. You decided not to seek re-election because you called Congress divisive. Why make a return. Why seek this seat again? Because the challenges that face America, Rafael, are even greater than they were six years ago, and Congress is even more dysfunctional than it was six years ago. Uh, our families face real, real struggles economically, affording college and otherwise, and what I would like to do is to bring a practical problem-solving approach working with across the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, all of us trying to move our country forward. We've got way too much divisiveness. And the final thing I'd say is one of the things that's different I think finally the American public's fed up with all the partisanship, the gridlock, and with that wind blowing behind our backs, if we can get practical-minded people there, I think we can make Congress better. Lord knows we've got to try. What does that look like? Because it doesn't seem like it's better. It seems like it's worse, especially the way the presidential election is going. So what will you bring? What is it? What is that sort of secret sauce or secret ingredient that you'll say this place can be functional? You know, look, I'm willing to work with whoever the next president is. I'm willing to work with members of both political parties. I don't care whether an idea is Republican or Democrat, liberal or conservative. What I care about is whether it works. It will help Hoosier families. That's the approach I'll bring. It's what I brought as governor. It's what I brought the last time in the United States Senate. I think that's what we need more of today. Baron Hill, the Democrat who decided to drop out, was he pushed out or did you ask him how, what, what happened there and will he campaign with you as you move forward? 
That was Barron's decision alone, uh, and I thought he made a courageous decision, and I felt a responsibility to do what was right for Indiana and America, too. And I would be honored if Barron Hill would campaign with me. I would assume that he would, but you'll have to ask him about that. I, I certainly will. Republicans are making an issue of your residency, saying you, you, you do not live in Indiana, and here you come back to run for the U.S. Senate seat. The same argument, we should point out, was made when Dan Coats ran for the seat that he's now vacating. Will residency be an issue in this election? No, Raphael. I've made... Uh, Indiana's been my home my entire life. I'm a Hoosier through and through. I can sing the IU fight song for you if you'd like. Uh, you want me to pull out my driver's license and, and show you? Uh, you know, look, uh, if Congressman Young and his allies want to lash out at me personally, that's a decision for them to make. Uh, but I choose to attack, rather than my opponent, the problems that face Indiana families in America. That's why I'm running. Your opponent, Todd Young, already calling you a lobbyist, that the seat is really not meant for a, a buy to come back and take when they want to take it back. How do you respond to that already? Because you've already seen the attack ads, and it's only one day that you've been on the campaign trail. Well, I'm not a lobbyist, you know, period. And uh, I think it's unfortunate that uh, Congressman Young has decided in his very first statements to attack me. As I mentioned, I'm not running to say anything about him. I'm running to try and help Hoosier families meet the challenges that they face. Good jobs, affordable college, enforcing trade agreements so that foreign countries aren't taking our uh, jobs and harming our businesses. That's why I'm running. To, we, we have more than enough negativity in Washington. Lord knows we don't need more. Uh, and so I just have a different approach. Let's talk about those free trade agreements because when you were in Senate, you did support some of the free trade agreements. You know that here in Indianapolis, the Carrier Corporation is sending 1,400 jobs uh, to Monterey, Mexico beginning next year. Is it time, though, to revisit those free trade agreements? You were not in the Senate when NAFTA was passed, but you were there when CAFTA and the other agreements with China and Singapore and Peru. Is it time to revisit those deals and make them fair? I think it is, absolutely. And what does that and, look like? And most of all, enforce the rules so that when other countries are cheating, we call them out on that. Look, as I mentioned, we're, we can compete and succeed against anybody. And the question is not whether uh, you know, we want an advantage of some kind. The question is what do we do when other people cheat? And they're cheating every day. And that's got to stop. And it's, it's insane for our tax code to actually provide an incentive for moving American jobs overseas. That's just fundamentally wrong, and one of the first things we need to correct. Another big issue, of course, is that of terrorism. We saw the events in Orlando, and people here in Indiana are concerned about domestic terrorism, international terrorism. How do we deal with that? Do we close borders? Do we build walls? W what is the answer to dealing with things like ISIS? Well, uh, we've got to go after ISIS very strong, and that means uh, in places like Syria and other places, if necessary, killing them before they can kill us because there are pseudo suicidal terrorists who would kill every man, woman, and child. They don't care that we're Democrats or Republicans. They don't care whether we're liberal conservatives. They're out to destroy America. And so we've got to be very strong on them. We've got to you know, make sure that we uh, scrutinize people very carefully you know, so that we can protect ourselves. But most of all, we've got to push back and fight them where they live in those countries and make sure that uh, the, the most important thing, Rafael, is that people understand that their hateful ideology is not something to which any young person, regardless of faith, should aspire to. They are not the legitimate represent representatives of their own religion. It's a distorted view of their religion. We in America, we stand for something better, and we should be proud of that, and ultimately, the rest of the world, I believe, will embrace the freedom that we represent, rather than the hate and destruction that they stand for. Senator Bai, thank you so much. We appreciate your time. Best of luck, sir, as you, as you move forward. Thank you, Rafael. Thank you, sir. Let's share that statement from Republican Todd Young saying most Hoosiers I talk with think the system in Washington is rigged against them. They think Washington lobbyists like Evan Bayh are part of the problem. I agree. Evan Bayh wouldn't defend Hoosiers from Obamacare when he was in the Senate, but as a lobbyist, he defended corporations who paid him to oppose it. He goes on to say this Senate seat does not belong to the Bayh family for whenever it's convenient. As someone you see so often here on RTV6, Martha Raddatz of AB News. She's one of the country's most respected journalists, the chief global affairs correspondent for ABC News and the co-anchor for This Week with George Stephanopoulos. Her Pulse of America journey has brought her to Indianapolis and the Mike Pence being named Donald Trump's running mate.
We're joined now by ABC News Chief Global Affairs Correspondent Martha Raditz. Martha, thank you so much for being it's here. It's great here. Great to see you, Katie. Time. Um, we know that you are stopping here on your way to the Republican National Convention. Um, what do you expect to come out of next week? What should we watch for? Well, I, I, I mean, I, it's going to be a show that they say is unlike any other. You're going to have Donald Trump. You're going to have all these speakers. Uh, the anti-Trump, dump Trump movement seems to be completely dead. I I think obviously, Katie, you're going to see a lot about national security next week after after the tragedy in Nice. I think that's going to be a focus. I think they're going to have uh, military officers speaking, uh, and and that will be a real real focus. And if you've if you've followed it, uh, the Trump people are saying what they want to do at this convention is talk a lot about why they don't think Hillary Clinton should be president. Well, that was my next question for you, given the terror attacks uh, and now most recently in Nice. Do you think that will change the tone of the discussion of this campaign overall? I think it does, and and there have been there have been so many though. I mean, it's just remarkable to me how many I've covered, and and to see that happen again. We were actually traveling Illinois, Indiana when news of that came in, and we're talking to people about that and how emotional they do get and how unsafe they start feeling here at home. So I, I think certainly that will be addressed. It has to be addressed. It's something that's on the minds of many people who we talked to when we drove. You know, as you know, Katie, we drove from Dallas, uh, where I covered the terrible tragedy there. Uh, and and we, went, we went to Oklahoma City. We went to Ferguson, Missouri. We, we made all these stops that we felt were relevant to what was going on in the election. Indiana Governor uh, Mike Pence now to join Donald Trump on the ticket. Ticket. What do you think he brings to the ticket? Also, do you think that he's well known nationally? You no, know, I should be asking you that, Katie. Come on, that's why we're here. I think you know. Even <laughs> we asked a couple of people yesterday on the trail, "What do you think of Mike Pence? Will he change it?" And there, there was one man in in Illinois, and I, it was very apparent he had no idea who Mike Pence was. Now that's not the case in Indiana so much, but it, you know, Donald Trump clearly thinks he adds he adds something. And, and that he'll fortify that ticket. I mean, he's a social conservative. You know, does he play off Donald Trump? Do peop are people attracted to Mike Pence who might otherwise not be to Donald Trump? I, I think that's the kind of thing you have to see. I, there's always so much excitement about a vice presidential pick. And then you're not quite sure how much that really matters in the end. You're also the primary fill and anchor for uh -huh. this week. Um, such an interesting job. And certainly at this time of the year, I would imagine um, how important is that role right now I, I that that role this year and you know we've watched George Stephanopoulos in that role as the primary anchor of that program it is extraordinarily important I think a lot of people might remember George's interview with with Governor Pence um, it, it is and it's become more important this race because this race is so different and I, I think you know the media at first didn't quite know what to do <laughs> and or how to react and respond so all the more important to focus on that and and what the best questions are and of course my role in that show has not only been political but it's it's bringing global affairs it's bringing my knowledge of of that to the table and we anchored the show last week from Dallas and I think that was important and it and it, it shows you how politics too crosses over so much why this race is so important how many issues we're dealing with in this country thank you so much for your time you Martha. bet it's, really it's great it's great thanks Katie thank, thank you. you thanks everybody